She tried to follow as best she could, but so far the meeting appeared to be almost entirely reliant on previous known material from missions and conditions of the Ordos Sanguinius in the past. She could follow a bit of the briefing, but overall she just felt extremely out of place as Earl prattled on with the details. Not to mention that she seemed to be abnormally distracted with every little detail of the library. Earl stood up front and center with various papers and books open on his desk, talking about where they were at as far as supplies and what they would need when the griffins went out again. She could spot Tyron staring down angrily from a perch high up in the library, his one eye death glaring down below. It was almost physically painful for her to look up at him as he seemed to instantly know she was looking and she would catch his glare. Oso stood beside her, happily, apparently, listening to and catching everything pouring out of Earl's mouth. Yin was there, too, or so she thought. She could feel a strange discomfort when she looked around. She couldn't pinpoint it, but something was keeping her from looking at something in the room. Other than that, Kroos sat in a corner, picking his talons with a new Susie knife, which practically looked like a sword in his grip. So, other than a few minor supplies, we will want to intercept the gangs looting that Flash Industries building. The gear will make a good bribe for the ghouls. Earl flipped through a few more pages as Oso looked a little uncomfortable as he raised a talon. Earl, I don't suppose we can try and trade instead. The big bird already had the look on his face that showed he would be shot down. Those cunts don't trade. Raider gangs generally don't. Besides, I've had some reliable stories about them. Mostly are all mares, and they tend to be little aggressive males. Lots of stories about them wearing stallions out before killing them. Even if we tried, we would not succeed. Tyron muttered from his perch, then added in a tone that was just a touch sharper. But you know that. Earl sighed and also grumbled. Yes, I know. I just don't like killing females. Tyron hopped down from his perch with a heavy thud. I noticed, but they're raiders. It doesn't matter if they're stallions, mares, hermaphrodites, or whatever. We see them, we kill them. He glared at Oso's eyes and nodded. Not out of fear, but something that looked like a reminder of duty. I. We don't have long. Those mares work pretty fast, and if the information is accurate, they're heading to Hoovington as soon as they clear that crap out. We need to get it before then, or Tyron will have a fit. Earl poked at the map. He seemed on point with his words, and she just couldn't get over how his expression seemed to imply that he wanted to be literally anywhere else. The most uninterested pony she had ever seen. Kroos raised an eyebrow. Why not Hoovington? Tyron shot a glare at Kroos, and he did his best to remain calm and avoid his eye. Now there's a few other items, but I'm sure you can figure that out as they go, as neither I know, nor how do I care. Earl dropped the last of the papers on the table and almost instantly picked up a book and he rolled back onto his chair as if to shut out the world and get lost in his book. Oso grumbled, picking up the papers as he began shuffling through them, but a single talon plunged through the papers and pinned them to the table. Tyron's eye leveled with Oso. I'm not for sitting. If that thing needs to survive for our plans, I want it packed in steel or bubble wrap or something. I have expected her to die falling down the stairs or choking at the dinner table. I don't want to lose the progress we've made two minutes out of the castle. Moso looked from Tyron to Lexicon before looking back at Tyron. Noted. He yanked the papers, letting Tyron's talons cut through them like a knife through butter. The one-eyed griffin did not blink, but seemed to aggressively push through the room giving the death glare yet again at Lexi, who instinctively cowered. Well, shit. At least someone here has some sense. I'll get the bubble wrap. 
Where do you guys keep that? Crows chuckled, poking about as if actively searching. Lexi gave him the stink eye, but he just laughed at her. What, are you gonna try and tell me is wrong? The odd sensation of Yin's perception magic faded. Lexi had been trying to figure it out so much that she noticed the sudden lack of a magical feel. She figured he was simply uninterested now that the briefing was done, but his leaving sparked a little more activity in her, and she carried on as if she hadn't noticed. I don't want to be strapped on with a ton of armor. Oso gave a fair flick to the small, still vanishing scar from her gunshot wound. Either he knew just how to hit it, or it really didn't take that much, but the same aching pain shot through her. Yeah, I don't want you clanking around behind me either, but I don't want to risk losing you the moment I look the other way. Come on, we're going to the armory. Cross's eyes snapped open and his attention sparked. Armory? You guys got goodies in this place? Oso sighed and waved him over. Follow me. We've been stocking up on supplies for a long time, and this place was a military installation before the bombs dropped. We've got a lot of stuff. Normally, it's just for the Pegasi when they leave the castle. Don't want to send them off defenseless. Alexei had already been terrorized by Kroos's marksmanship lessons. She didn't really want any more to do with it. Do we have to? Oso's response was short and very stern. Yes. I mean, like, do we have to do it right now at this, like, very moment? She looked up at him as she followed at a short distance. She would do what she had to, but she would certainly use a day or two before she could indulge in such unsavory duties. Yes, we have to do it now. We are likely heading back out in a few hours. He pushed open a door and started down the hall. A few hours? I thought I'd be here for at least a few days or weeks. Lexi slowed, but got a nudge from behind, as Kroos apparently was very happy to get moving and didn't want her stalling. Yes, normally we would spend a day or two unwinding, but as you should be intimately aware of, we just made a huge breakthrough on our project. We need to contact another group and let them know, and try to convince them to help. He smiled, looking back at her with a seriousness in his eyes. I can't really even put into words how big of a deal it is that we got the Susie to join us. They continued for a bit longer as Lexi pouted and fumed, but finally they reached a large door with silver marks on it. Griffin Talons had carved the old Ponish word for armament into the door. She gulped and shook herself before stepping inside with the Griffins. Ah, <sighs> goodness. I hope this is easier than the first time. Sweat dripped off of her, and she whimpered as her body bucked hard with every passing second. Do you want to turn? Oso's voice called out down the hall a little. Nah, I had my fill. Kroos called back, his figure stretching just beyond the corner. Back to it, then. The massive griffin stepped forward again. Lexi always thought he was so kind and remembered how at ease she'd felt hearing his voice. She never knew he could be so rough. Come on, up, assume the position. She whimpered, struggling at the very least to get her hind legs straight, spreading them at least a little so the force of the buck didn't knock her over again. Can we stop? It's so tight. It hurts, and I can barely feel my hips. They're shaking so much. He loomed over her. Not a chance. Now, let's try this again. Maybe I can go to sleep tonight knowing the job has been done right. He gave her a firm swat on the rear as he closed the distance. His talons on her shoulder, then leaned over her and smiled. Now, Lexi, let's do this again. I know it hurts, but just bear with it. Hold your breath if you must. Focus, and let's get in there. She clenched her teeth and prepared for the shock. Drenched in sweat, her hips shaking, she closed her eyes and waited for the moment that it all began again. Now! Oso pushed her forward, and Lexi bolted forward, almost clumsily, into the little gallery they'd set up. She instantly rounded the corner, the battle saddle biting into her sides as she tensed and bit into the trigger. 
A spray of 45 pocketed the sandstone in a rapid spray. It took about two seconds, but finally the sparkle cola bottle broke, and she whipped around, activating sats, and put two semi-automatic rounds of 556 into the bottle at the far end. She queued five, but hit the bottle on the second bullet. Then, quickly turned about, she heaved her forelegs and bucked as hard as she could. The steel armor over her hind legs covered her hooves pretty well, and despite her pathetic physical capability, she knocked over the sandstone, and did some rather severe damage to it as well as it came to pieces when it hit the ground. Panting and whimpering, Lexi's legs wanted nothing more to do with this, and all but gave out. But the armor's strength-enhanced rotors took note of her excessive exhaustion through her pit buck and froze, refusing to let her fall over. Much better. I'm honestly surprised. Now if only you could do at least this good every time without freaking out. Oso smiled, coming over and pulling the pin, keeping her straps on. Almost instantly, she fell out of the armor, which continued to stand. She lay there, on the ground, whimpering until Oso scraped her up and cradled her like a foal as he held a healing potion to her lips. She desperately drank it down before whimpering again. I don't want to go into that armor ever again. He chuckled, slinging her onto his back. That's too bad. We aren't going to risk you dying out there. And at least with this armor, you can carry your share of gear. What about the other options? She fussed like a foal on his back as he just laughed and kept walking. Kroos, you can continue. Just don't use more than the ammo here. I'm taking the princess back to the baths. A bath? She wanted to say something, even if it was just to pretend she had some say in what she did and where she did it and went. But she had to be honest. A bath sounded wonderful. Yes. Yin mixes some of his stuff into the baths, and has a minor healing effect. You'll be up and ready to go after a quick soak. He moved along the halls, carrying her. She couldn't help but sit there. So tired, her mind started to wander. It didn't help that the perception magic in the halls pushed her to space out even more. She chewed her bottom lip and caught herself smelling Oso's fur. He didn't seem to notice, but it just made her blush and curse her hormones. She pulled back into her head and allowed logical and common decency Lexi to duke it out with horny Lexi and impulsive Lexi. What snapped her back to the present was the shifting doors and the sudden sensation of steam hitting her. She curled up just a bit, the healing potion in her at the very least, giving her some basic movement back. But having Oso and Kroos running drills on her for two hours would have probably done some pretty serious damage to her muscles had they not given her healing potions twice during practice. She was really happy to get a little more familiar with weapons and armor, but she had to be honest with herself. If she never saw that armor or a single bullet again, she would be way too happy. Oso carefully placed her on the floor and started undoing her hair. Her saddlebags were still down with crows. She hoped he remembered it when he came back up, she really didn't want to go back down there. Her thoughts were distracted as Kroos took something that gave off a soft glint of gold from under his armor and hid it in a box where he placed with the rest of his armor. Lexi blinked, but Oso didn't appear to notice. She would ask when she was in terrible pain. For now, she would just take a long, hot bath. She put her things into a box, and this time she dropped her pit puck onto the box as well. She felt comfortable, and started limping towards the bath as Oso dropped one last item into the box. A small sack of something. It looked like small boxes of ammo. She remembered him grabbing a bunch of stuff from the armory before Hoof, but she didn't quite see everything before he strapped her into the armor. They came out together back to the same tubs as last time. A small thought passed through her head as she looked up at the griffin. Hey, why are you here? Her heartbeat quickened, hoping she could detect any hint of romance. To her dismay, he just smiled at her and responded flatly. So you don't drown in the bath. Grumbling loudly, she spouted off, I'm not a foal. It's not too hard to take a bath. He chuckled and sat just outside of the tub. 
Okay then, go in. It was a very short trip. Just heaving her legs over one at a time and she could get in. But she slowed angrily as she kicked her leg out but couldn't get it over the ledge of the bath. But what Just, why won't you? She snapped back, glaring as she heard Oso chuckle. But her head came back front as he scooped her up and helped her back into the tub. The hot water soaked into her muscles, ebbing away the pain and soreness. She was in so much pain she had practically gone numb, but this was heaven for her destroyed body. Oso sank in the tub next to her with a happy sigh, closing his eyes and calmly breathing. She faced forward as lewd thoughts hit her brain. She chewed her lip before as casually she could as she looked into his tub, but she couldn't make out anything where the steam and lighting was. She looked down at herself before clenching her eyes tightly, more lewd fantasies flooding into her head, nearly trampling logical Lexi who screamed at her, but she didn't want to stop. Breathing in deep, her heart thundered as she cringed, and her lips parted as she put her urges forward. Uh, oh so? Hmm. He almost didn't register her words, but he certainly stirred. Did you need something? C can I ask you something? She looked over at him as he barely lifted his eyelids. He gave a soft nod and she shivered, pushing her jitters back. Um, I... I was wondering, and uh, it's okay if you don't want to, but uh, do you think uh, maybe me and you... Can we... Um, uh... His talons smoothed over her head, softer than she thought possible. She nearly instinctively moved into it, savoring the physical touch. His other talons came back to the back of her neck. But just as her jitters began to turn from fear and excitement to uncertainty, that excitement died right there as his talons came down to rest on her shoulders, softly pushing her back. I'm sorry, little one. No. She looked up at his very serious eyes and a small touch of shame hit her, as she spotted the fringes of tears in his eyes. She opened her mouth, ready to speak, ready to say anything, ready to plead with him to change his mind, ready to apologize, ready to say she was joking, anything. But a talon came up to her lips. I'm sorry. You're plenty beautiful, and I'm thankful for everything you've done, but I'd hurt you. A flare of naughty excitement started to bubble in her, but didn't go anywhere other than more shame. And... I'm... I'm sorry. I just can't. This rude awakening was like the coldest of cold showers. She felt rejected, but she understood, at least for the most part, that he had let her down a little easier than Kroos or Tyron, despite the latter being something she didn't even want to go along with. A spark of pain shot through her as Oso stood up from his bath and slowly made his way out. If you need help, just call for Yin. He started out and she trembled. She felt guilty. Looking at him leaving, she watched him open the door and something hit her. The golden glint. She vaguely recalled seeing it before, back on their trip up north. Suddenly, as logical Lexi began making theories, she didn't feel as rejected. The thoughts poured through her, and she seized one that didn't make her feel bad. It was possible that it was a locket of some sort. Perhaps an old lover or something that represented a promise he made. Her mind went into overdrive trying to focus on the possibilities. Anything to cloud up the shame and rejection. But watching him leave, logical Lexi's voice went silent as impulsive and horny Lexi spoke up. Hey, you're alone. The evening trudged along surprisingly slow, and despite Oso's warning that there would likely be leaving in a few hours, the hours passed and the day turned to night. The bath and events during left Lexi feeling rather guilty and tired and very relaxed. The moment the sun touched the horizon, Lexi found a relatively good spot in the library to lay down. She figured that Earl had something to do with it, as there were blankets and pillows nearby. Her wide yacht marked the beginning of her night's rest. She would have loved to have a cup of tea, but 
not sleeping outside was a good step in the right direction. But the thing that she uh, sealed the deal was the smell of the old books. Before the war, she had fallen asleep in the library at least three times a week growing up. Even her mother's house smelled like nothing but books. The little house in Canterlot was surely dusty or something by now, but it was the birthplace of great memories, and some perhaps not so great ones. She loved her mother very much. Lexi always saw her as powerful, smart, and capable, but the older she got, the more she realized that her mother was dangerously introverted and angry at the world, most likely because of her father. Still, she was Lexi's mother, and that, to Lexi, made her a good mother, even with the difficulties growing up. Lexi sighed, breathing in the sweet scent of the musty books. As her eyes fluttered closed, she saw Earl sleeping happily at his desk, a book draped over his face. She smiled, wondering what kind of pony he was once he opened up. Fading into sleep, she barely took notice of a small feature. She couldn't really tell if she was just seeing things, but she could have sworn he had no cutie mark. She hummed happily, but something forcefully shot her eyes open. She blinked and stood upright, confused. No oh, goodness. Either I'm dreaming, or Yin has some repairs to do. She took a single step forward and looked back to see a blurred image of herself following in a stream of movement. A long, sad howl touched her ears, something that confused her, but she swore it sounded like Yin. He was weeping. She licked her lips, her eyes darting to and fro, unsure of what to do. The sorrowful cries seemed to seep into her soul, pained and all, but surrendered to a fate he wanted nothing to do with. She sneakily moved through the library. Taking notice that Earl was gone, she peeked at his desk. Sprawled in ink over and over the bold, near angrily written words, Order of the Chaos, I am the Resilience. She dug through the papers, then another voice touched her ears. She turned to see Kroos, whispering to himself softly, rocking back and forth. She closed the distance and touched his shoulder, but recoiled as he was nearly painfully cold to the touch. Afraid. I'm so afraid. Not weak. Please tell me I'm not weak. I must be strong. I must be strong. I have to be strong. Mother was weak. She didn't hide the fear. Mother. Mother. Lexi inched closer before she noticed something. She wasn't in the library anymore. This was the shooting range where Oso had trained with her earlier. You shouldn't be here. You don't belong. She whipped up to see Oso facing away from her. Opening her mouth to speak, she found herself unable to. She came closer and reached out to him, but his painfully cold talons wrapped over her foreleg like a vice grip. When he turned to her, she saw his face rotting, his feathers only vaguely attached, his bones poking through the skin. You don't belong here. Hell, none of us do. Her mouth opened in a silent scream as she yanked her hoof back, tumbling and hitting her head on the ground before getting up and bolting down the halls. The sorrow-filled voice cried out again, making even less sense. She's gone. She's gone. Why won't you wake up? The very halls felt like they were slithering as she ran for her life down them, the image before her blurring into such a degree that she couldn't tell in the slightest where she really was, until certain aspects of her surroundings would snap at the focus before vanishing into the blur once more. The screams of the fillies and colts resounded around her, screaming for their mothers and fathers, screaming that it was scary, that they felt so alone, so scared. Above the cries, she could hear Cheery whimpering. See the poor girl sitting right there in front of her as Lexi ran as fast as she could. He doesn't love me. He doesn't love anything but his books. He knows, but he refuses to speak to me. I don't want to go. I don't want to leave. It's safe here. I know here. I don't want to go. As if the floor itself was yanked out from under her, she tumbled down into a pit filled with slick, slimy roots. And almost instantly, 
The sweet, sticky smell of mashed berries hit her nose. Her heart thundered in her chest. She didn't want to know what was next. She tried to cry out again, but nothing. Damn, it's taking so damned long. Lexi turned to see an old earth pony. She blinked and looked closer to correct herself. This pony was downright ancient. He looked like he was 90% wrinkles, but she recognized the voice despite how much aged wheezing it included. Earl grumbled in his absolutely ancient age as his eyes leveled with her. You're too noisy! She would have let out a yip if she could make any sound at all. Backpedaling quickly, she found herself in freefall, landing as a pile of scared purple pony. The shrill sounds of screams and gunfire chased her upright and forward once again. She continued as fast as she could. The path ahead was nothing but constant dead underbrush. She blasted through until she swatted a pony, shivering with a pistol in her mouth. Lexi slowed, blinking as she stared at the pony with the 10 millimeter pistol in her mouth. But she heard it loud and clear. I don't belong here. I don't belong anywhere. Another pony rushed in, and she could see the panic in both their faces. The crack of the shotgun, the flawless shot of the 10 millimeter going off, the shotgun slug impacting the mare's forehead with a sickening crunch. But the slug clearly bounced off as it looked to be a magical reverberation echoing across her body. Both ponies fell to the ground, having clearly shot each other right between the eyes. Coming closer, horrified, she looked at the filly, filthy mare, and her level of horror doubled. It was her. Almost the very second she realized it, she could hear Kroos chiming in as if it was nothing at all to him, the way he always regarded her. Oh, I shot him. Mixed feelings shot through her. She knew it had to be a dream, but why would her own mind be showing her this? It was painful, all of this. She wanted to stop, so she desperately tried waking up, but something seized her shoulders and she found herself staring into a single hateful eye. Her hooves fused to the floor, and the single eye practically engulfed the room as he grabbed her violently. You don't belong here, pony! I don't care what they say, you don't belong here! Tyron's talons dug into her, and her mouth opened in a silent scream. But in one sudden, jarring moment, Tyron's face twisted with confusion and surprise as he was torn away, and quite suddenly, she felt oddly tense. She felt extremely confused as she was in an office, an office that looked vaguely familiar. But a whole new horror was laid out before her as she was nearly nose to nose with the Ministry Mayor of the Ministry of Morale. She looked just as horrifying as usual, but oddly, she looked a touch younger than the last unfortunate time she saw her. Do you know why you're here? She felt herself about to speak, about to answer the question, but the nightmarish pink pony raised a hoof. You're here, because you're gone, gone. She took a deep breath, and with a happy smile before it all turned to rage, bucked up too many times. She felt the absolute horror flood through her as she leaned back in the chair, but then something hit her. She felt the chair tighten around her midsection. The odd feeling of her hide grinding with the overly pumped features. She tried to look down, but couldn't move in any way other than what felt like a predetermined set of actions. I tried. I'm sorry. I thought I could get him to talk about being nice. She wanted to blink. Those words came from her own mouth, but they sounded oddly uncomfortable and alien. Yeah, but you know what happens when you try to play good cop alone with a confirmed spy? Pinkie Pie leaned uncomfortably close. She felt herself gulp and leaned back, trying desperately to put some distance between them. They... <clears throat> they kill them... They kill themselves with a the glass of water you bring in! Pinkie Pie was absolutely furious, and the moment a soft knock on the door sounded, she shot a glare back at Lexi, and was honestly surprised that she didn't knock the door off its hinges. She felt herself look back at the door as it creaked open. The mirror on the back of the door flashed an image, 
of what could have been an eggplant-colored earth pony. Instead, showed a fat, light-brown, middle-aged earth pony stallion. The brief glimpse filled her with mere horror, and what came through the door practically brought her to orgasm. An unnaturally tall, pale stallion. His eyes were the very textbook definition of come hither. His horn was long and curved. He walked with a near-absolute authority of inconceivable physical attraction. It was like Luna herself dug through every steamy romance novel she had ever dreamed about and hoof-crafted the perfect stallion for her and her alone. Pinkamina, darling, I just needed the slightest touch of your time. Lexi nearly squeed herself. Even this vague body language was too much. She could even feel a strong emotional flare coming from the stallion she was at the moment. Even he was attracted. No, I don't have time. I'm damned busy, and I know your tricks. She threw an accusing hoof at him, and he seemed aghast, but in an overly dramatic and playful way, which seemed to just add how fabulous he was. Pinky, such slander, and you didn't even follow it up with any teasing. You can't just wind me up and leave me here like this. He seemed to nearly throw himself against a wall in an overly dramatic fashion. I said no, you f- Nearly hissing through her teeth, her head jerked to the side as she glared at Lexi. Ticker! She slowed and more aggressively cleared her throat. Ticker, go home and come back in the morning. We'll finish this later. She felt the fat stallion. She was quickly getting up and waddle out the door, fuming with relief. Pain and fear. Just looking back for a moment, but getting an odd, almost knowing and seductive smile from the tall, fabulous white pony. Slowly making her way out, she felt the chubby pony move along at a slow and steady pace. But the very moment she exited the building, she picked up the pace. Almost nonchalantly, she came up to an alleyway, and the very moment she stepped inside, she bolted forward, galloping as fast as she could, which was painful even slower than she could have outside of this strange dream. She felt herself horribly out of breath, sweating profusely as her heart thundered dangerously in her chest. Her body hurt. Her head felt like it was caught in a vice. But the thing that caught her attention was the irregular details of this odd dream. This was Canterlot. She watched as she bolted through the back alleys until she could just barely see the train station. She felt her body redouble in effort as she bolted forward, but the pain erupted through her body as she was tackled and plowed to the ground. She instantly identified the M.O.M. badge on the shoulder of the pony who tackled her. Now, oh, Ticker, why did it have to be this way? She felt her hooves forcefully wrench back until there was a wet pop, and she screamed along with the fat pony she was inside. They had just broke his right front leg at the shoulder popping it clean out of its socket, and wrenching it even further away from its point of origin. You don't understand. I'm not a traitor. I'm just a terrible at my job. That crazy bitch will never believe me. You have to let me go. She felt the fat pony start to blubber and whimper as the pony with the ministry armor hefted what she was pretty sure was a high-voltage taser. Doesn't matter. It was a test, and you failed. Good night, ticker. She saw the taser swing at her face. She woke up screaming almost instantly, a rolled up newspaper stuffed into her mouth and another repetitive one swatted over at her head. Goodness gracious, shut up! She coughed and sputtered and finally spat out the newspaper. What? What? What's going on? Earl swatted her again on the head. You are screaming in your sleep, so I put you in a memory orb. But you kept screaming, Holy shit, you're noisy. Earl rubbed the bridge of his nose, and she looked about. Oso was there, and so was Kroos. But Kroos looked almost like he had fallen down the stairs. Despite how he held his arm at the shoulder, he still smiled and laughed. 
<laughs> I've been telling her that for a while. I don't think she can help but be annoying. Oh, goddesses, shut up! Earl's magic popped something out of the back of Lexi's head. It almost felt like a band-aid. He dropped it in front of her with a grumble. Here, I had it in storage, and it works with all that junk attached to your pip buck. Keep it for now. Lexi blinked, looking at a small cable leading to her pip buck, to a small metal box, and then off to a small electrode looking contact point. What? Earl didn't even look back as he spoke. It's a recollector. It lets you use memory orbs. Kind of a compact one. Not the most reliable, but hey, it's portable. He went through the door and closed it firmly. She looked to Oso and Kroos. D did I seriously? Did? Did all that really happen? Oso looked at her a little unsure of what to say, and his feathers fluffed up at his neck. The last time he did that, he was playing dumb to try and direct the attention away from Yin. But Crow stepped in, still rubbing and holding his shoulder. Yeah, basically. But don't think about it. It was time for you to get up anyway. We're heading out. Lexi blinked, looking up for a window at the far side of the library, but she couldn't see any light. What time is it? Crow shrugged and Oso chimed in softly. Morning. The sun should be up soon. Come on. We have some things to work out, and we have to get you set up. Lexi shivered at the thought of getting ready, and her fears were realized as she followed them down the cobblestone circle room. The armor was there waiting for her. Can we go without the armor? She tried her best, and most charming, please don't make me, smile. But her answer was surprisingly talons, Tyron's talons, swatting her over the head. No! You're lucky I didn't have you actually bubble-wrapped. He passed her, taking a long pull of a bottle. She was surprised to see the smell coming off of him was so strong that it almost hurt. He smelled like rubbing alcohol. The slightest touch of sensation on her mind told her that Yin was there somewhere. But to her relative surprise, Cherry and two slightly younger pegasi were present as well, helping with boxes and supplies as well as some mild cleaning. Her attention was wrenched away when Oso held up the harness, but she could see a few changes. Okay, little one. I reshaped it here and there before setting up padding all the parts I dug in. Now it should be much more comfortable, but you will still need to wear this suit. He hefted a small patched-up onesie. It works like mild barding, but it's mostly just stuff to keep the suit from rubbing and scratching uncomfortably. And we adjusted a few things. Here, let's put you in it. She didn't really want to get back into the harness, but she didn't see any way out of it. That and Crow seemed very happy to see her using any armor at all. To her surprise, the barding fit extremely well, and the harness went on as if it was even easier. It still felt hard to move in, and she was clumsy, even just walking. Aye. Now we turn this thing on. Oso fiddled with the harness. She did notice it was tightly heavier and clunkier. With a soft click, her eyes opened wide as the harness seemed to stand up all on its own. She could basically relax entirely and the harness would hold her up. Okay, now you have enough battery for about a week. But if you need a boost, use this little trigger on the switch bit. He tapped a bit in front of her, and she took note of a few switches and buttons. Just be careful. Activating it makes you burn out batteries pretty quick. The power draw is pretty high, and the battery casing I had to weld to the harness isn't meant to handle power at that level. I'd give it ten minutes of being overloaded like that before it burns out. So don't do it unless it's a real emergency. She nodded, much happier with this setup, despite how much she didn't like the armor. Kroos poked in and flipped a switch, which popped open a small metal hood over her head. A bit like a folding helmet, but it didn't look too durable. Cool. Can I get one? Kroos circled her, admiring the armor. Sure, if you can find one for Griffins. 
I had to weld together Enclave Raider and Ranger armor with a bunch of old Skycart parts. So yeah, if you can find all the pieces, I'll get something up and running. Oso replied happily as he double-checked the dimensions. Kroos grumbled and Lexi happily pinged the button over and over again feeling the hood pop and slide back, forth, rapidly. But to her fright, a nearly empty bottle shattered over the hood, glass shards even pinging off her glasses. She let out a squeak and fumbled before falling over. There was a soft whirl as the joints in the armor popped loose, allowing her more flexibility so she could stand up. But the moment she did, the armor popped back securely. It was a neat feature, but she was a little more concerned with the flying bottle. She looked up to see Tyron clearly gesturing for the room's attention. If you're done, we have shit to do. He held up a map and indicated three red circles. That's right here, where the ghouls live. And we have to go here to this location and ambush the Flash Gang for one of their shipments so we can bring it back to the ghouls. Now this third location is to be our base camp. I'll be heading there first to clear it out and set up the mines. Only approach from the ground and from the southeast. All other entry points will be very, very heavily trapped. You will all be securing the gear, stopping by the base, and then all together we'll head to the ghouls. Kroos leaned Oso and whispered, Why do we need a bribe? Do you not have a contract with them? Also, a uh, crow ducked fast as a rock flew through the air where his head was just at. There was no reaction from Oso as Tyron growled. No! I need a bribe because they're stuck-up, miserable cunts who refuse to listen to reason! Lexi marked the reasoning for the bribe as no pony likes Tyron. The old gray bird grumbled as he cleared his throat and continued. That's our mission for now. Keep this dumb bitch alive so the Susie will stay doing business with us and get the shit for the ghouls. Kroos nodded and Lexi felt a little unsure, but also gave a small nudge. She smiled back at him, hoping that he had already forgotten all about the last time they spoke. He seemed very friendly and didn't seem to have anything to say on the subject, so she figured she was in the clear. Hey! Lexi turned about as Earl floated a bag to Oso, and he poked in, popping a berry into his mouth from the bag. He smiled and gestured a thank you to the pony. Lexi chewed her lip and leaned in a bit to try and inspect Earl's flank. To her surprise, it really was blank, but she didn't get a glance or a chance to say anything before Earl's hooves closed in on either side of her head and nearly forcefully pulled her to look into his eyes. Listen. Very carefully. If you find a very specific red scarf out there, bring it back. It's mine. Lexi's face scrunched up in confusion. But before she could speak a word, Earl stepped back and a bright green flash consumed her vision. Instantly, she couldn't see anything but the vague shapes of three griffins vanishing into the bright lights as the ground beneath her gave way. Footnote. Level 6 achieved. Perk added. Intensive training. Being run through the ringer, healed and run through again with a crash course on combat has given you plus 1 to strength and endurance, as well as plus 5 to guns and armor skills.